Um, about now it's been about 10 years ago, uh, I started having occasional pain in my back. Now, you don't have this. Just let me tell you right now, you don't have this because people want to run to the doctors. And, but in my lower back, I started having some pain that was getting worse and worse as time went on. Strangely, as it was getting worse and worse and worse and worse, I uh, was getting, becoming in more and more and more and more and more pain. At the same time, strangely, I entered into a rather serious conflict in the church that I was attending because I went up one day, no kidding, to the person who was the chief counselor in the church that I was attending at the time, and I said, hey, you know, I'm just wanting to get to know some people. I said, how about, you're the chief counselor. I, I happened, I had spoken on this church fairly regularly. I said, how about we have breakfast? He says, oh, great. He says, I'm thoroughly postmodern, and uh, I'd like to talk to you as an apologist. Well, we had breakfast together, and he told me, I asked him the standard questions, do you think it's absolutely wrong to torture babies for fun? And he said, I can't say it would be absolutely wrong to torture babies for fun. You know the drill. I'd say, well, was it absolutely wrong for the Nazis to murder the Christians? He says, I can't say it would be absolutely wrong for the Nazis to murder the Christian, Christians. I said, do you believe the word of God is inerrant? I don't think, frankly, he thought it was, well, no more inspired than any other work because, frankly, he was thoroughly postmodern. Well, I started confronting the pastor of the church on this, and, and uh, he just took no action. It turned out they were good friends. In fact, they began to go, oh, you're just misunderstanding them. I thought, misunderstanding them? I mean, for crying out loud, I've done apologetics my whole life. I, I, I understand postmodernism when I see it. So he says, oh, you're just misunderstanding me. He doesn't really believe those things. So I had breakfast with him again. Asked him all the same questions again. He says, yes, all, you know, agreed to him. So I went back to the pastor. I said, I, I, this is what on earth? In the meantime, I'm becoming in increasingly pain, pain, more pain. I don't. You know, he said again, no, you just misunderstood him. So I had breakfast with him again and asked him, you know, and I, he said everything again, what I said. Anyway, finally, I confronted the pastor. I said, if you don't do something about this, I'm going to take you to the board. Well, now by this time, I wasn't able to sleep in my bed anymore more because I was in so much pain in the middle of the night. I was getting up and down. I didn't want Jeannie to wake up. And uh, <clears throat> so finally, I, say, I told the pastor, I'm going to tell the board. And uh, it went to the board meeting. And uh, it, I knew I was in a bad way when the board member on my left says, and I said, he doesn't believe we can know objective truth. And the board member on my left said, I have trouble with the word objective. But, you know, I mean, for those of you in Christian apologetics, you know, if somebody has trouble with the word objective, I mean, we're in deep kimchi. Anyway, um, uh, the, the pain was increasing and increasing to the point where I was just in pain, not incessantly. It, it kind of came and went, but it would be, I wouldn't sleep for more than two hours at night without waking up, just in immense pain. Um, finally, uh, I just, it's so weird that this both happened at the same time. I confront the pastor on this. And I am just now miserable. I mean, I'm just, not, I'm just physically terribly uncomfortable. I've been going to doctors, by the way, and they just say, oh, you just need to see a physical therapist. You just have lower back problems. Uh, that's fine. And I'm like, uh, you know, wow. I, I didn't frankly believe them. Thankfully, my next door neighbor was a surgeon. And I went to my next door neighbor, a retired professor of surgery, as a matter of fact. And I told him what was going on. And, and he says, you know, I'd get a CT. And uh, so I, you know, I talked to my uh, orthopedic surgeon about a CT, and he says, oh, I don't think you need one. He took an x-ray. He says, I don't, you know, you just have lower back problems, need to see a physical therapist. <laughs> anyway, um, I, uh, so I tell the pastor, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell the board. I tell, so I send a letter to the board. The day I tell the pastor I'm going to tell the board, my wife was uh, overseeing the women's Bible studies in our church. She was fired from 
leading the women's Bible study, leading just the, the actual women's Bible study meeting. She wasn't the head of women's ministry. She was fired from that the same day I confronted the pastor. Uh, all, very hard on my wife. All of a sudden, her ministry is now gone. Um, we had to resign, basically, you know, I mean, we, we don't have a church, basically. We're now in deep trouble because the board was not going to, they, they didn't want to acknowledge anything. Uh, I finally uh, decided I'm going to just get a CT. I waited until January 2nd because, you know, I had disaster insurance and I, and it, I had a $5,000 deductible. And I thought, you know, if, if this is serious, we might as well do it all at once because it was in December. I thought if we start it now, I'm going to owe another 5000 on top of it. Anyway, so I get, it's kind of interesting, Friday I go in and I get this CT. And uh, uh, Monday morning, so this is, a, it was a Friday, I got the CT, January 2nd was a Friday. Monday morning, uh, the phone rings. And I answer the phone, and it's my orthopedic surgeon is on the phone. And I thought immediately, he says, hello Clay, this is so and so, your orthopedic surgeon. And I went, immediately I went, this is very bad. <laughs> This is really bad. You know, how often do, do I mean, doctors have their nurses call or whatever, right? They have their nurses call and I've got the orthopedic surgeon is calling me and I'm not through a nurse first. And he says, you have a mass on your spine. And I'm like, a mass on my spine? And my wife had picked up the phone and she was listening in. And he says, basically, he said, you need to go see this doctor at Cedar sinai Cedar sinai that's a long way from, I live in Laguna Niguel. Cedar sinai is a long way from Laguna Niguel. And I said, oh, no, I'm sure it'll be fine. I can see a doctor out here. Now, right, I'm talking to an orthopedic surgeon. I'm not talking to a GP. He says, no, no. He says, you need to see this doctor in Cedar sinai And I says, no, no, I can see this doctor out here. I'm sure it'll be fine. I'm sure this doctor out here will be fine. He says, no, you need to see this doctor in Cedar sinai So anyway. Finally, I, after he said it, I mean, literally, we went back and forth four or five times. I went, oh, so I guess you're saying I better see this doctor at Cedar sinai So anyway, I made an appointment to see this guy who happens, by the way, to be the director of the musculoskeletal tumor program at Cedar sinai And he's the director of the program. And uh, he says, indeed, you have a mass. And, you know, they sent me off. They, the next thing, by the way, and this is very important. So when he hung up the phone, he says, you need to see this doctor at Cedar sinai when he hung up the phone, Jeannie and I met in the hallway and we clasped hands and with tears streaming down our faces, I led a prayer of thanksgiving to God. And frankly, I knew at that moment that I defeated Satan. I knew it. Now, it's very important for me to tell you I led a prayer of thanksgiving to God with tears streaming down our faces because I knew the news was serious and I didn't know where this was going to end up. And, uh, and I don't, there's, Christians can make two major errors. One, they can collapse and go, oh, where's God? And the other thing they can do is, oh, I never, I never even, you know, didn't even bother me. I've had some people do that. I go, you mean you got a serious cancer and you never, you know, was like, and I, I, anyway, it just seems unreal. That's why I'm always careful to say, so with tears streaming down our faces, I led a prayer of thanksgiving to God. <clears throat> and like I say in the back of my mind, I thought, you know, I've just defeated Satan. Well, anyway, so they said, but you need to have a biopsy. The, 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 ortho, the, uh, the guy I was seeing in uh, Cedar sinai as an orthopedic oncologist, which there aren't a lot of orthopedic oncologists, but he says, uh, he sends me off to the local hospital, thankfully, for them to do a biopsy, which hurt a lot, by the way. And uh, as they sent a, something in to get a piece of my spine. Um, and so I'm like, okay, what's happening? What's happening? What's the, what's the diagnosis? The, my, my, uh, my orthopedic oncologist says, oh, it's probably not going to be much. You know, I mean, he, or he thought it would be a smaller, a lesser seriousness of tumor. And I get the results back. And I've got what's called a chondrosarcoma, which is, you'll be dead in two years. It's just, that's all there is to it. You're not going to make it past that. And when I get the news that I've got this, that the, that the biopsy reports this, you know, deadly, deadly cancer. I mean, again, tears are streaming down our faces. 
we met, actually I think in my wife's office this time, and we held hands and I prayed a th prayer of thanksgiving to God. With tears streaming down our faces, I prayed a prayer of thanksgiving to God. And I knew, frankly, that I had uh, defeated Satan again. But that didn't make me feel, you know, I mean, I'm still hurting. I, I'm just telling you this so that you understand, you know, that I'm not trying to be fake here or go, oh, no, hey, no, I never had the slightest doubt. We just smiled all the way through it. It was very difficult. And there were many times of tears after that, many, many, many tearful times. That was another big one where he says, you know, and plus he says, and I, so I talked to my orthopedic oncologist and he says, you know, I think they may have made a mistake. He says, but, you know, I said, well, what happens if they're right? And he says, oh, well, we wouldn't take it out. We'd just start giving you chemotherapy, see if we could shrink the, shrink the tumor. And if we can, then, then we might operate. And I'm like, oh, that just sounds bad. You know, that's just really bad. So he says, but the operation will tell. He says, I'm going to go, or he says, I need to see the slides. It turns out that this guy that they, the, the Lord had engineered for me to see is one of the top in the top 10 in his field in the world and uh, writes journal articles on it. I'm sure I'm in his, one of his later jour latest journal articles, by the way, because they keep calling me to find out how I'm doing. But anyway, uh, uh, but he says, he then looks at the slides himself and he later tells me, he says, I think they made a mistake. He says, they don't see this kind of cancer very often. He says, I see it often. But he says, the operation will tell anyway. Uh, within about two weeks of being uh, told that I've got a mass, two and a half weeks, I was in Cedar sinai and uh, went, underwent a six and a half hour operation and uh, lost my tailbone, the bone above that, and half the bone above that. They took that out. They took the reason, what they did. By the way, one of the other things is all of a sudden at one point he says, he says, I want this doctor to assist me. I'm like, this other doctor to assist me. And so he got uh, the, the guy who was the chief of neurosurgery for Cedar sinai to assist. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> so I've got the director of the musculoskeletal tumor program and the chief of neurosurgery uh, at Cedar sinai to uh, assist. Uh, and uh, uh, anyway, they, they took it out. They did say that the hospital had made a mistake, uh, that I did not have a chondrosarcoma, that I had a much lesser cancer much less aggressive cancer. A, a cancer, frankly, that tends to return a lot, but because I went to see an orthopedic oncologist, he took half-inch margins, which uh, I found out later in talking to other doctors, they were like, he took half-inch margins? Wow. Uh, and um, a half-inch margin, by the way, is you, you're taking, you're cutting away cancer, and then once you've got the last recognizable cancer cell, you take another half-inch. That's what it means. We, we don't see any more cancer in the tissue. Let's take another half inch now. Um, the fact that they did that uh, kept me from, it turned out, having to have uh, radiation therapy. I didn't have to have chemo. Uh, so uh, interestingly enough, so I've got this thing going on with this church, and I come out and I go, okay, they got it out. I'm going to be getting MRIs for a while really regularly, praying that it won't come back, that I won't have to deal with it again. I wrote a note, I wrote a letter to, an email actually, to the pastor of the church I was in, and I said, you know, I, 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 when somebody has cancer like I've just had cancer, I mean, somebody goes through this kind of a life event in a hospital, I want you to know, and I've told some of you this already, I said, I want you to know that you really st tend to slow down and, you know, re-examine life and, and uh, pause and reflect. And I said, and I want you to know that I don't take back one word of what I said to you. And uh, so, see you later, you know. But anyway, I thought, I don't, I stand by every word I said. This is just horrific. Uh, anyway, it's a betrayal of the church, of course. It's a betrayal of your church to do that. Uh, because you shouldn't be sending your more vul most vulnerable members to somebody who says they, they don't, can't say for sure it's absolutely wrong to torture babies for fun. I mean, your most vulnerable, vulnerable members of your church shouldn't be seeing them. Anyway, uh, that, that situation may have changed. I don't talk about the church, the Lord, uh, because I don't know what, where the church stands now. But anyway, I'm fine. I have went through for five, about five years MRIs. Uh, I've gotten many CTs and MRIs every six months and much more radiation than anybody should ever get, frankly. <laughs> but I guess one CT is like 
50, the equivalent of 50 x-rays, and I've had, oh, guy, at, at least 10 CTs on my chest, so I've had <laughs> 500 x-rays on my chest. That's a lot of radiation, but you know what? Here's the good news. I'm fine. Uh, the Lord has used this powerfully in my life, and frankly, I kept the faith. I endured what was brought against me, and even if I was going to get chemo and even die from it, I was determined because I'd already decided in advance that I was going to honor God through it. And I'm going to say something to you now that might seem, this might seem a little shocking to some of you. But I never doubted God. Now, that doesn't mean that I wasn't very deeply sad sometimes. That's not what I mean. Sad over, oh no, what if I leave my wife? What's she going to do? Who's going to take care of her? We don't have kids. You know, we, as you know, we took in abused foster kids. But, well, they weren't all abused. But, but, but there was a lot of sadness. But frankly, through it, I, I knew. Uh, that, that, what, why would I doubt God over this? The reason I say this, I'd already decided that these are the kinds of things that happen to people. You remember, I said, when we talked about human evil, I said, remember, only one thing's going to prevent you from watching everyone you know die from murder, accident, or disease, and that will be your own death from murder, accident, or disease. Uh, take that seriously. That's the way you're going out of this world, one of those three ways. And... Uh, so I, so I didn't doubt this. I, I remember taking a class from D.A. Carson, who's my favorite Bible expositor, and he says, you know, he says, when his wife got cancer, he said the same thing. He says, frankly, he says, when my wife got cancer, I didn't doubt God at all, because I already understood these things happen. This is what happens to humankind. And so I think it's very important that we just come to the realization that these kinds of trials are going to come upon us but as we continue to honor God through these kinds of things and continue to demonstrate ourselves as being men and women of faith, we conquer the world, we conquer Satan, and we justify the judgment of not only angels, but of humans who go, God's not fair. Because then in the last day, we're going to be in a position to say, sure he is. Um, so the scripture says in 1 Peter, oh, by the way, one thing, I'll tell you one more story about that. <clears throat> so I get, I hear that I've got a mass and I'm Im immediately scheduled. I don't, that was based on a CT. I'm immediately scheduled for an MRI. It's like two days later. It's like 7 a.m., maybe 6.30 in the morning because these MRIs, they run all the time, you know, so they can make their money back. You know, they don't want to have any downtime. So I've got an appointment early. It's the middle of winter. It's like January 5th or 7th or, you know, whatever. It's early in January. And it's just dark. It's cold out. I'm walking the halls of this, this medical facility, you know, big medical facility in my area. And I'm thinking about how ugly the walls look, how the hospital walls just seem to have ugly looking walls. And I looked up at the Lord and I said, Lord, why me? Why me? Now, I want you to know I wasn't complaining. I really, honest and truly, I hope you understand in the time, the eight weeks we've been together, uh, that I'm, I'm pretty honest. I think I'm a extremely, I think I'm an honest person. Why, well, I don't need to qualify it. I'm an honest person. I wasn't complaining. But my question was, how come right now, at 47 years old, am I going through this? And immediately the words came to mind. Everybody's going to have to do this. And I went, and you know, I, I just got it immediately. It was one of those weird things where I went, everybody's going to go through this. What I mean is, every one of you, this is, I understand, not a pleasant thought. Every one of you are going to be walking a corridor of a hospital or a doctor's office, medical facility, wondering if you're going to get news that might be the end of your life. Every one of you, unless you die first. See? Unless you die first, Everybody's going to be walking in the corridor going, I wonder if this is going to be the day I get this life-ending news. Everyone is. Unless, like I say, you die first. And frankly, although that's probably not terribly encouraging to you, that was really encouraging to me at the time. Because it was like, Clay, you're not. This is life. And a lot of good things have come about, frankly, from it. My walk with the Lord is much better than it was. It was good before, but it's much better. My walk with the Lord is much better. I'm a much more disciplined person. 
frankly, a little side benefit when it comes to the problem of evil. Nobody ever, which they used to say some years earlier before this happened, go, yeah, but what have you really gone through? I go, well, I you know, lost part of my spine to cancer. It was in an immense amount of pain for a long time. They go, okay, never mind. And, uh, but God saw me through it. And if Christianity is true, this is how you defeat Satan in the heavenly realms. This is how you humiliate him. This is how you justify God's judgment. I pause for a moment for any questions, comments that anyone might have. Yes, Jason. It's kind of an aside, but when we're talking about resurrection bodies, and obviously Jesus had, you know, examples of his side, his feet, his hands, do you think, since you're, since because of the operation, you know, you've, you've been missing part of your earthly body when you're resurrected, will that be restored? I mean, this is obviously... I, I, I would, I, you know, frankly... Thankfully, for what I lost, I don't miss it all that much. Uh, I, I mean, it doesn't make that big a di difference in my life, to be frank with you. But uh, I, I've never given it any thought on whether I would... Uh, I, 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 well, it, here's the short answer. I think your, our bodies will be restored to perfect working condition. I'm sure they will. We're going to have a body like Jesus' glorious body. We can be hugged, but in our locked rooms... We talked about those things when we talked about your glorification two weeks ago. Anybody else? Oh, sure. I, empty teas aren't going to go through heaven with one leg. I mean, that, that's crazy talk, right? I mean, sure. I mean, hey, I, I've only got one leg. Double amputees. Yeah, some people in heaven just aren't as lucky. I mean, no. Come on. <laughs> no, of course not. Anybody else? I always tell people that was a very, very, very rare form of cancer. Very rare. So, you don't have it. Extremely rare. It's what? It was, it was a big operation. <laughs> like I say, when, when, when I was found out that the, the, the director, the director, he probably had, I looked at the thing, he probably had 70 doctors underneath him. The director of neurosurgery at Cedar sinai he probably had 70 doctors underneath him. And he's assisting. <laughs> yeah, this is big. And I'm sure they turned it into a big... See, that's one of the things. I learned one other thing. This is just a total aside. That, uh, but uh, if you really have an unusual operation going on, going to a teaching hospital is a very good thing. Uh, because as he said, you know, the doctor's like, you know what? He says at the hospital you went to, they don't see a lot of these things. He says, but a teaching hospital, they're going to blow it up and put it on the screen and the class is going to sit around and talk about it. So <clears throat> anyway. But the Lord... The Lord took care of me. You know, I, I mentioned to you about pain because people go, yeah, but you were in a lot of pain. That's only a fact about my life. Do you understand? The physical pain that I went through is only a fact about my life. I'm talking about the physical pain. It doesn't hurt me today. I'm not in... The fact that I was in physical pain nine years ago doesn't affect me adversely today. today. And I th it's, I'm trying to get you to think just a little bit because people go, oh, but there's so much pain. Pain is just a fact of my life. So we talk about this light and momentary affliction, it says in 2 Corinthians, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And, when, and, and slight and momentary. Yes, I really was in a lot of pain. But right, it does not affect me to, you know, I don't, I don't wake up in the middle of the night, I haven't always, I'm going, ah, I was in so much pain. It's just a fact about my past. It doesn't affect me today at all. So, I, yeah, I wouldn't want to go through it again. Duh. But, you know, I don't. Anyway. Any other last comments or questions about this? Okay. So, I already read that passage. I'm going to skip to those doing the video editing, and I'm going to skip this. Oh, no, I won't. Let's see here. I'm going to read it. So now you're going to have to adjust this entirely. Anyway, I'm going to quote you from some of uh, Perpetua's diary from 203 AD 203. says, We were placed in a sort of platform before the judge who was Hilarion, 
procurator of the province since the proconsul had lately died. The others were questioned before me and confessed their faith. But when it came my turn, my father appeared with my child and drawing me down the steps besought me, have pity on the child. The judge Hilarion joined with my father and said, spare your father's white hair, spare the tender years of your child, offer sacrifice for the prosperity of the emperors. I replied, no. Are you a Christian, I asked Hilarion. And I answered, yes, I am. She says, a few days later, we were lodged in the prison and I was terrified. Notice, I want to pause here just for a minute. I'm not saying that being a Christian, you're never scared. You know, and I certainly, when I had cancer, I was scared. I, would, I knew God was taking care of me, but it was still scary. You know, I mean, it's still a scary event. She says, I was terrified as I'd never before been in such a dark hole. What a difficult time it was. With a crowd, the heat was stifling. Then there was the extortion of the sol soldiers. And to crown all, I was tortured with worry for my baby there. Then Tertius and Pomponius, those blessed deacons who tried to take care of us, bribed the soldiers to allow us to go to a better part of the prison to refresh ourselves for a few hours. Everyone then left the dungeon and shifted for himself. I nursed my baby who was faint from hunger. In my anxiety, I spoke to my mother about the child. I tried to comfort my brother and I gave the child in their charge. I was in pain because I saw them suffering out of pity for me. These were the trials I had to endure for many days. Then I got permission for my baby to stay with me in prison. At once I recovered my health, relieved as I was of my worry and anxiety over the child. My prison had suddenly become a palace so that I wanted to be there rather than anywhere else. You'll remember Corey Ten Boom saying that life in Ravensbrook occurred on two levels. One, the external life we lived grew every day more horrible. The internal life that we lived before God grew every day more glorious. Here you have Perpetua going, you know what? I was just happy. And frankly, by the way, when, other, uh, when I did, I mentioned I, didn't, I never doubted God. I knew he was with me. I was, that was one of the closest, I mean, I felt like God, you know, man, my relationship was close. I didn't feel like, where is he? I was like, hey, I know you're there. Again, though, I had already decided that these kinds of hardships happen to humans. Not just Christian humans, all humans. It says in Revelation 12, 11, and they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. <clears throat> if you take my resurrection course, I talk about your martyrdom and uh, just the idea of getting, just the idea of that you could be martyred for the cause of Christ. You might as well get comfortable with it. Get co I've told you this already several times, but get comfortable with the idea you're going to die. Seriously. And I think people are like, that's not possible. It is possible. Because that's the only thing you know about your future for sure. I mean, you might even skip taxes for the next few days somehow. But you're going to die. Sooner or later, you're going to die. And um, get comfortable with it. You can't do that, though, unless you really believe in heaven, can you? Forever. I'm going to live forever. If, if, if forever is not real... Well, then you can take the atheist position and not get comfortable with it and just say, you know, and wait for worms to eat your body and you're done. So it says, so now we're learning to conquer. I'm still talking about that. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark age, world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Who are we at war with? See, we're not at war with Richard Dawkins, right? We're not at war with legislators and ed educators who are trying to fight us. That's not where the war really is. Those people, frankly, are just largely uh, Satan's blinded minions. They don't know any better, frankly. They're just acting according to the desires of their flesh. Jesus again said, if my kingdom is not of this world, if it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest from, by the Jews, but now my kingdom is from another place. So what do we conquer? See, what we're not conquering, at least it's not important that we conquer, the real battlefield isn't in boardrooms. The real, the real contest isn't on battlefields. We're not trying to conquer humans or their institutions, really. 
the important battles don't involve profit and loss statements, promotions and demotions, or even bullets and missiles or bombs. They, not really. Those aren't the important battles. The most important battles are not about stopping terrorism or thwarting evil humans. Those aren't the most important battles. The most important battles involve thwarting the desires of spiritual beings and the fight that you are having against spiritual beings. And I'm not talking about demons here, really. I'm just talking about standing up for Christ in the midst of hardship, no matter what comes against you. This is greater than anything a special forces warrior has ever battled. Any, I mean, and by the way, I've told you, I think one of the, the big point of this life is the knowledge of good and evil. And that is accessible to somebody who's in a wheelchair just as is accessible to somebody who is a full body. In fact, it may, the, the, the knowledge of good and evil is right there for the person in a wheelchair. They're having to learn these things too. It's open for everyone. So we, you and I are now learning to conquer, even though the world looks at us as the lamb that is slaughtered, or slaughtered lambs, we are more than conquerors, no matter what they throw at us, but what they throw at us, we're going to continue to honor Jesus, and that's the way we conquer. It isn't if they come to your house to take you off and put you in prison for being a Christian, if our government decided Christianity is illegal. It isn't that you, hey, take a gun and see how many of you you could take down before you go. That's not conquering in the spiritual realm, right? That's just trying to save your hide and not being a testimony uh, when, when the opportunity comes. Thus, the verse I brought to you before, Matthew 10, 28, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body. Do not be afraid of what can kill the body either, frankly. I see people worried about all these kinds of things that, you know, come upon the world, and I go, don't worry about it. I tell you, Jesus is right. I'll tell you who to really be afraid of. Be afraid of the person who after the body is killed can cast the soul into hell. And I go, whoa, I hear you. I'm, I'm there, man. I got it. That's who you want to be afraid of. Fear him. So now we learn to conquer. And everyone, this is the Greek word Nike again for conquer. Everyone who's born of God conquers the world. This is the victory that has, that has conquered the world, our, even our faith. So you and I then need to learn to, you need to learn to reign in your brain. Do you understand? You need to learn to reign in your brain. That's where the big battlefield comes. If you can, if you can control your thoughts, man, you can do anything. So decide to honor God when horror happens. As it says in Proverbs 16.32, He was slow to anger is better than the mighty. He rules his spirit, then he takes a city. Notice being a valiant soldier, if you can control your anger, you're better off than a valiant soldier. If you can keep your spirit in check, you're better than soldiers that can take a city. So I encourage you again, decide to honor God when difficulty comes upon you and you participate in justifying the judgment of Satan and his minions and everyone else who accuses God. And this brings us to our last point for the evening. This is dessert. And we will reign forever and ever. So we saw the Lord originally created us to reign. Satan conquered our first parents, so he reigned instead. Therefore, Christ conquered to rescue us from Satan's reign. So now, we just talked about this. We are learning to conquer the world and to conquer Satan. And finally, and we will reign forever and ever. So Matt, or Luke 12, 32 says, Jesus said, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. He's going to give you the kingdom. Jesus said about those faithful and wise, He says, I tell you the truth, He will put Him in charge of all His possessions. Luke 19, 17 says, Well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of ten cities. Take charge of ten cities. 
So I bring you back to and remind you again of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let them rule. So think about <clears throat> the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. In fact, the first verse of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible before you, I mean, the, you, about humankind. The first verse of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible about humankind is, and God said, let's make a man in our image and in our likeness and let them rule over all of the creatures on the earth. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's, you know, I mean, re- ruling is taught in the Bible. This brings up a strange thing, and I'm going to do an excursus on this now. After I was teaching on this some years ago, uh, a, a younger woman came up to me, eh, 35, 40-year-old woman came up to me and she said, but I don't want to reign over others. What struck me as so strange about that is she was a major equestrian. Uh, in other words, she, she and her husband owned at least two horses, if not three, and they literally held reins when they used them all the time. They actually reigned over other beings constantly. In fact, I'll tell you something. I, we like to reign over other beings. And so I have here a collage of different kinds of examples of people reigning over beings. So you've got a person holding some sort of a, my brother and sister-in-law would know what kind of a bird that is. But anyway, some sort of a parrot-looking bird. Uh, falconry. Right? He's controlling the falcon. A dog on a leash, a German shepherd on a leash. Girls reigning. They're actually holding reins, by the way. That's what it means, right? Reins. You've got your sea world people making dolphins do weird things. And then you have my wife and I, priest Steve Irwin, uh, holding a stingray in, in Grand Cayman. And uh, it was interesting because we, we got a private tour in Grand Cayman and they would go along, this, this tour guide were with Grand Cayman, the waters only. Well, you can see I was actually bending down to pick up this thing. It's not, not as actually deep as I was there. I'm bending over to get underneath this stingray. And so he would scoop these things off the bottom and hand it to you. And I'm like, hey, you stay here. You know, he tried to get out of my hands. I'm saying, you stay here, you bad boy. But anyway, that was before Steve Irwin. Um, <clears throat> but we like to reign over other beings. We, I mean, all of these things I'm talking about, every, dogs and cats and fowl, we like having them, well, you can't really reign over a cat, can you? That's probably the only animal that you can't, probably the only animal that you can't reign over is a cat. I mean, it's like trying to herd cats, you can't herd cats. But anyway, uh, you get the point. But this brings up an issue that alarms a lot of people. And what this brings up is, you, but that means potentially, of course, some people are humans now, could be reigning over other people who are humans now. And indeed, I think that's entirely the case. But Jesus talks about that in Matthew 20, verse 20. It says, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. Jesus replied, to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom I, they've been prepared by my father. When the ter- ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. What's Jesus saying here is, You don't need to worry if some beings are over other beings and perhaps some beings are over you in the kingdom. Don't worry, they won't lord it over you like the Gentiles do. By the way, it seems to me that it's about responsibility in this life, right, to the the one who had five cities and or five... Uh, five talents and made it into ten talents. Jesus says, take ten, I'll put you over ten cities. Uh, that it's about responsibility in this life. But don't worry because you won't be lording it. Nobody will be lording it over you. And so Jesus tells us, by the way, uh, how to be great. So you want to say, I'd like to be great in the kingdom of God. Well, he tells us right here how to do it. How does he tell us to do it? Be a servant. That's just the opposite of, 
Hey, if you want to be great in the kingdom, really go out and serve the kingdom of God and serve other people. Serve the brothers and sisters in Christ. Serve people, because that's how you'll be great in the kingdom of God. Be a great servant. Don't sit there and go, hey, there's no money in it for me, or that's not my ministry, or, you know, I mean, I, uh, you know, I, other people... Other people ought to do that little type of ministry. I don't need to do that kind of ministry and so on. Just serve people. Don't worry about whether money's involved. And by the way, in ministry, when, you know, I mean, frankly, I get paid to speak at other places a lot. Uh, sometimes, though, uh, I've spoken when I've gone, you know what, it's, if it's a church that's in my area and the, you know, like in one church, a youth group, they asked me to speak to the youth group and they didn't have any money. I said, I'll come over and speak to the youth group. Because I can't be doing it for the money. I mean, certainly a laborer uh, deserves his wages, certainly. Uh, you know, do not, you know, cover the mouth of an ox when he's treading out grain, says Paul. But, but uh, I need to just be of service. To whoever calls me or whoever contacts me, I need to be of service. So what will we reign over? Notice it says, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Now that's got to be one of the most amazing verses in Scripture. Is that The Scripture here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, Do you not know that we, that would be you, if you're a Christian, that we will judge angels? Paul says you're going to participate in the judgment of angels. You're going to participate in judging angels. Why on earth might you be qualified to judge angels? Well, we've talked about it. Isn't it every creature's excuse that God didn't give them enough evidence that they should obey him? That they didn't make it plain enough? So God is proving to the world through us what he can accomplish with little evidence. So those with the most revelation will not necessarily be the most rewarded in the kingdom. It will depend on what they did with it, right? And now I bring you to a passage that really, I think, opens up. I know, that's a weird painting of Jonah being swallowed by a fish. But anyway, um, <clears throat> this explains why, this is what I'm talking about. Consider Luke chapter 11, verse 29 to 30. So Jesus said, this is a wicked generation. It asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, so also will be the Son of Man of this generation. Two a couple of interesting things there. Notice it's a sign of wickedness to say, I need more evidence. This, this is actually what wicked people do, is they say, I need more proof. And isn't that what the, many skeptics do today? They go, there just isn't enough proof. I need more proof. Of course, for those of you that have studied the resurrection of Jesus, you know that's an amazing sign. In fact, that's what Jesus says. I'm only going to give you one sign, but notice Jesus says, I am giving the world a sign. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth, and what? Come back to life. That that is the sign given all humankind. They don't need more than that. But anyway, um, he says, he goes on, Luke 31 and 32, 11, 31, 32. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now one greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here. We've already talked about this a little bit, but let me just emphasize it again. Jesus is saying, I did all kinds of miracles in front of you, but how much evidence did the Queen of the South have? She just heard that there was somebody named Solomon that seemed to have a lot of wisdom, and so she decided to, you know, mount up, and she was on her way to find this guy out. All she hears is she's just responding to the tiny, minuscule, relatively minuscule amount of revelation that she has. And so, and she goes, I gotta go, you know, I need more. Notice the response to a very small amount of revelation. Jonah just happens to come out of a fish and he walks down the streets of Nineveh. He doesn't really, if you read 
If you read Jonah, he doesn't even want him to repent. He wants God to just smack him dead. But he walks through the streets and he just goes, Rip, you're all going to die. God's going to kill, basically God's just going to kill you all. He walks through the street, not even so, tells him to repent, just you're all going to die. They all repent and God spares the city. And Jesus says, well, someone greater than Jonah is here. So he says, the men of Nineveh are going to stand up at the judgment and participate in the condemnation of the people that Jesus was talking to because the men of Nineveh could say, we had even less, inf less information than you did, and yet you rejected him. The queen of the south will be there too and say, we didn't, we, I, I just heard there's a wise guy named, wise man, I shouldn't say wise guy. There was a wise man named Solomon. I wanted to hunt him out. You rejected the Lord of glory. And so us then, we have very little evidence of the truth of the kingdom of God. I mean, comparatively, the resurrection is amazing evidence, but comparatively very small to seeing what they saw in Jesus' day. So we will be, and consider how much, how little evidence we have compared to what the angels saw. So because we have less evidence than the angels ha have, we can stand up and participate in the judgment of angels because we have much less evidence than them, and yet we continue to honor God through it. Thus the trouble, if you don't continue to honor God, then you just end up being one of the naysayers. So it says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, his intent was that now, when's now? Right now, not in the past, through the church, that's you, right, the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. So through you, through Christians throughout the ages, you are a lesson to the rulers and authorities where? In the heavenly realms. You're actually instructive to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. I ask here, why do angels rejoice when a sinner repents? Of course, we're not talking about fallen angels. They don't rejoice when a sinner repents. We're talking about the elect angels. But then second, what makes the elect angels rejoice? Is it not at least partially because as we come to Christ with even less evidence than the angels had when they fell, that we demonstrate the truth of God's plan and we demonstrate God's goodness and we demonstrate God's faithfulness. And frankly, I am just, have been just blown away and amazed through the hardships that my wife and I have gone through how God has used these hardships for our good. I have no regrets. By the way, it says uh, worldly grief just leads, gives you sorrow and leads to death. Godly grief produces repentance and leaves no regret. And here's the amazing thing. I have no regret over my having cancer. None at all. I don't, I don't regret having cancer. Doesn't. It's just really, I mean, now it's a, it's a fact. Except that it did a lot of wonderful things in my life because I grew and matured and God used it to develop a lot of godly character in me. You understand. <clears throat> so it says, I, now we're talking, he, we are, my last point for the night, we will reign forever and ever, but the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and possess it forever. This is, right, let me stop. This is Daniel, right? We're talking like the middle of the Bible. In fact, the first, this is the, almost the middle of the Old Testament, right? I mean, this is not in the New Testament. But the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all his, what? Rulers will worship and obey him. Revelation chapter 2, verse 26 says, To him who overcomes, to him who conquers, to him who is faithful through hardship and suffering, even if it results in their own dismemberment or death, those who are faithful, to him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations, just as I received authority from my Father, I will also give him the morning star. He was an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
pay attention to the divine. Listen up. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So it says in Ephesians 2, 6, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Right now, by, because of your organic union with Jesus, you're right now seated with Christ in the heavenly realms right now because you're one with Jesus. Revelation 3.21 says, To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Again, he says, he was ears. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you, do you hear it? I think the non-Christian, of course, listens to this and goes, blah, 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 blah. The true Christian goes, Res this, this resonates to the true Christian. The Holy Spirit is in the true believer, and you go, you know, I read this and I go, oh, wow. So we come to, I told you, <clears throat> the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, the first verse about humankind, Genesis 1.26 is, and God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let them rule. So that's the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, the first verse about humankind the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, the last verse of the last chapter of the last book of the Bible before you get to the epilogue. The epilogue is pay attention to these words, don't add to them, don't take away from them, I'm coming quickly. That's the epilogue. But the last verse of the last book of the Bible, uh, Revelation chapter 22 verse 5 is, well, there will be no more night, and they will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. So the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, the first verse about humankind says, and let them rule. And the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, the last verse, in fact, before you get to the epilogue says, and they will reign forever and ever. So that's how the Bible begins and ends. That's how the Bible begins and ends about humankind. I'm going to play you. I, Lewis captured this. <clears throat> ah, wait. <laughs> Lewis, oh, I've got it. What? No, stop it. I'm going to start this over. Probably all of you have seen this, but you need to see it with the lights off. <clears throat> You've, like a, huh. There we go. You need to see it with the lights off, for crying out loud. Like I say, you've seen it, but.
All right. <clears throat> you know, it's amazing what you can do with film. What Lewis had done there is he, you know, you, if you make the story kind of about something else, you can touch on the major points of the, the gospel, of the good news, without saying this is what it is directly, because then it would be lackluster. But you can, you can do an analogy, and this is an analogy that's a wonderful one. And frankly, Lewis gets it. This is the point. If Christianity is true, God has called you to reign over his kingdom forever. If Christianity isn't true, then we should all be doing something else. I, I keep wanting to call people back to that, because either it's true, either embrace it all, or just, just get rid of it all. You know, I'm reminded of Jesus saying, because you are not hot or cold, but lukewarm, I'm, uh, warm, I'm gonna spew you out of my mouth. Either embrace all of it, because if you embrace all of it, then Christianity is amazing. What the Lord has done for you is amazing. And it's much more than just a moral code, isn't it? Christianity far exceeds a moral code. Certainly that, it has that with it. But the moral code, the things that Jesus wants you to do, is largely encouraged, and you can be so motivated by, going, by understanding what he has in store for us. I love Hubble telescope shots. I guess what I'm saying to you is, do we get it? Do we get it? Do you get it? He's giving us the kingdom. Not just any kingdom, but the kingdom. And when he comes, there won't be any other kingdom. He talks about cities. He talks about true riches. He tells us to be faithful over things here. But then he tells us that the things here, the things that seem so big to us, are small. Well, my brothers and sisters in Christ, if we think these small things big, what are we going to do when we see really big things? Well, really big things come, and we're going to reign over them, and we're going to do that with Jesus. That's God's plan for your life, and it's always been the plan. And believe it or not, I'm done. God has given you the king. Any last questions? You're going to get a little, a little early. Shocking. Any questions, comments? Now. You're not getting out that early, so don't think you're just, if you just be quiet, I'm just going to, oh, well, just go. <clears throat> yes, Jason. If you, I can't, I don't think it's possible for you to go through the Christian life very long without suffering some sort of persecution if you're really trying to live a godly life. Let me give you some, uh, <clears throat> uh, well, I, I don't suffer it every day. You know, I mentioned the church, I lost my church over it. I remember Jeannie and I walking around in a rather, you know, right, this is perfect that it happened, you know, that all this came down midwinter because it's like dark and a lot of the days are overcast and drizzly and we're kind of walking along. I remember one Sunday morning, we literally, instead of going to church, we're just walking around because we just didn't have a church to go to. And frankly, we ended up losing basically all of our friends. Uh, that was, you know, standing up for the kingdom. I'll tell you another way you stand up for the kingdom. When a friend of yours says, let's go see this movie or that movie, and you happen to know that there's a lot of move, nudity in whatever movie they want you to say, instead of going, you know, that doesn't seem like a movie that's, you know, I'd really want to see, say, you know, I wouldn't feel right about seeing a movie where it has a lot of sensuality and, and nudity in it. So you'll get persecuted, I promise. <laughs> you'll have people going, oh, so you like think you're holier than me then, a better Christian. You'll, you'll start getting persecuted. Um, 
uh, it's true in America. You're not going to you're not going to run into it constantly. But but certainly, if you're living a godly life, you're going to offend some people, unless you're not with you know. And frankly, where the persecution is mostly going to come from is a lot of people who are you might call chinos, Christians in name only, uh, who are going. Oh, you think you're really holy, don't you? You think you're really special. And, uh, but I, I, I think sooner or later you're going to run into persecution. Uh, well, you have to, because the, 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 a lot of Christians are going to be offended when they hear that you don't do certain things. And, and you may not know that they're talking behind your back and calling you names. Uh, I mean, Christians, thankfully, uh, we need to stand up, by the way, for the really hard issues. We need to stand up for the really hard issues, like homosexuality. I, I, I told my family once, I said, I just can't, I'm not going to tell our kids, you know, our, you know uh, I don't think it's wise to tell them that, that Santa Claus is true. You have to tell your kids about Santa Claus, he's everywhere. But, and I talk about this in the resurrection course, frankly, but, uh, oh man, you want to make people very angry at you. Tell them that, that uh, we shouldn't be telling that Santa Claus is true uh, to our children. You'll make people You'll, you'll suffer persecution right away. Oh, you just want to rob them for fun. Who do you think you are? You're one of those people that just hasn't any little joyless, jo empty Christians. Or, anyway. But uh, anyway, well, I guess all I'm saying is, is one way or another, people will, will see that you're trying to live a godly life and they're going to call you names. At the very least. As I told you, spoke, when I spoke at that thing that Prashanth watched, you know, at the end the guy came up and he says, F you. And uh, I thought, well, I was kind of glad, frankly. I thought, oh, good, I'm suffering reproach for the cause of Christ. I kind of liked it, frankly. I mean, I didn't like being called, you know, having that, somebody tell it to me. But I was like, I'm standing up for the cause of Christ. So, by the way, I don't necessarily want this in the final video, just to let you know. Just to, for, for, after I was done with my thing and I opened it up for questions, we should probably end it there. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.